So thank you for the introduction. With my talk, I would like to um, question or challenge the uh, effect of altitude training on elite performance, as I do not think they are as convincing as I think they are perceived or recognized to be by many coaches, for instance. What got me started, or what, uh, what led me to do the, the first Live High Train Low study that we did, was the question of how does Live High Train Low actually increase performance? Uh, as you know, I guess, uh, Levine and Stray Gunderson said that it was primarily mediated through an increase in red cell mass, whereas the Australians said it was primarily augmented uh, by, by changes within the skeletal muscle to change uh, exercise economy. So I'd like to go through our study that we did and then kind of put our study into perspective and see how they relate to other studies and thereby come to the conclusion why I don't think that elite athletes by all means should engage into uh, altitude training. So the main goal with our first study was to determine how live high train low increases performance. Is it related to blood borne effects or is it related to things within the skeletal muscle? We also wanted to conduct the first double blinded and placebo controlled study which, has, which hadn't been performed until uh, we did it. And of course we wanted to use elite athletes. We did our study here in, uh, in Premenon in France where also other studies have been conducted and just as here in Aspetar the top floor can be made hypoxic. The subjects could cycle at uh, sea level, train at sea level. Before we did the actual study, we had the Danish national cycling team, the four kilometer pursuit team live there for, um, for three weeks also to see whether it was feasible actually to have athletes living in those rooms for 16 hours per day as we did. Pretty much copied Ben Levine's initial study published in 97, uh, except that we didn't use natural altitude but hype, uh, normal baric hypoxia. We exposed our subjects to, 14, uh, to 16 hours of hypoxia per day because it has been shown that about 14 hours per day <clears throat> for three weeks at 3,000 meters improves uh, HB mass by about 1% per week. So to be on the safe side, we did 16 hours. Uh, most of our, all the pre-study, all the pre-intervention uh, measurements were done in duplicates. Our plan was to have the subjects exposed <clears throat> to the intervention for three weeks, and then there do our scientific uh, manipulations, which I will talk to you about uh, soon. But after three weeks, we didn't really see the changes that we expected, so we prolonged it with a, an additional week. So in total, we had four weeks of live high, train low in a placebo-controlled manner. We then studied them <clears throat> one and two weeks after the termination of the intervention period. To find out whether the performance effects following live high, low, live, tra uh, live high train low were due to an increase in red cell mass. We measured their red cell mass as done by everybody else these days by the uh, CO rebreathing method. The subjects did a VO2 max test. We removed the blood that they had gained uh, during the period or we normalized the blood values to whatever they were before the study. They sat around and waited for half an hour. They did another max test afterwards they were retransfused with their own blood to see whether the effects of live high train low were due to factors within the skeletal muscle. We took biopsies and analyzed mitochondrial content as well as mitochondrial function. If live high train low was to increase <clears throat> psych, uh, exercise economy, I thought the mitochondria would be the best place to look for such changes. So these are the, uh, the uh, data from the skeletal muscle biopsies. 
compared to the placebo group, we saw no increase in citrate synthase activity, which is a measure of mitochondrial content. Likewise, we saw absolutely no changes in the oxidative phosphorylation state three capacity, which is kind of the the VO2 max, if you will, within the within the skeletal mitochondria. We saw no effects there either. We saw no differences in exercise economy at a given workload. It says here hypoxia. We did the test in normoxia as well, and we saw no no changes, as I said, in oxygen uptake for a given workload. And I think uh, this kind of reflects well a study that we did together with Ben Levine years and years ago, where we had more than a, a hundred subjects showing that exercise economy is not changed following altitude acclimatization, at low altitude, high altitudes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think today most will will agree that the effects of lift high, train low on performance, if you have it, are or are due to an increase in red cell mass. Maybe Chris can comment on this later. I don't know whether you, what side you are on. There. In terms of HB mass in our study, we didn't see an increase at any time point in any of the subjects. So following three weeks of live high, train low, where we wanted to do the isovolumic chemodilution, there was no blood that we could remove. They hadn't increased their red cell mass. After four weeks of live high, train low, the uh, lift high train low group had not increased their red cell mass by any more than the, than the placebo uh, group. And as you can see, after one week of termination of the intervention period and two weeks after, there still wasn't a difference. The vari variation is kind of, is, uh, well, of course you have variation since these are, are human subjects. We saw an increase in red cell mass in uh, half the subject. The, and I define an increase as being bigger as a typical error of our measurement. As you can see, there are five other subjects who do, do not respond or have a, a slightly uh, decreased uh, HB mass. This essentially shows the same. We had some subjects in hypoxia that did not increase their red cell mass. We had some that did increase their red cell mass, and in the placebo group, kind of shows the same pattern. Some goes up, some go down. I don't think this is due to uh, the um, interventions as such, but simply due to normal uh, variation within, within the human being, as shown by Walter Schmidt and Nicole Palmer previously. In the guys where we saw an increase in red cell mass and where we removed the exact amount of red cells that they had gained during the intervention period. Uh, first of all, so sorry, for, with the increase in red cell mass, there was not a corresponding increase in VO2 max. So um, the inc I think that the increase in red cell mass in these guys is simply of too little magnitude to increase uh, VO2 max. At the group basis, we saw no differences in VO2 max after three weeks and four weeks of live high train low in the intervention group, and we saw no further, uh, or we also saw no changes after one and two weeks after, ter after terminating the, the altitude camp. To have something real, or as, as real as we could get it at least for performance, we did time trial on where the subjects rode on their own bike. They had a, a power tab in the back so we could record the, the, the power they did. And they did, uh, it's not like cycling outside, of course, but they did the last uh, 26 kilometers of the Milano San Remo to kind of have something that resembles outdoor activities. And there was no, no difference in the placebo versus the live high turn low group. If you pull the data, there's an increase in in, in time trial performance over the over the 10 week duration that we were there suggesting that it's a good idea to do training camps at least but that you don't necessarily need to have a hypoxic group 
we investigated the sprint capacity following lift height, following this, this, this uh, lift height train low study. And the reason we did this was that if you are chronically exposed to high altitude, you may have an increase in both skeletal muscle buffer capacity as well as blood buffer capacity. So in the skeletal muscle, we analyzed the buffer capacity. And from the arterial blood samples, we calculated the, uh, the buffer capacity within the arterial blood. And as you can see from this slide, we saw no changes in either skeletal muscle or blood buffer capacity in the hypoxic training group and neither in the placebo group. This two slides shows Wingate performance, so 30, 30 seconds all out sprint performance. This is the very first test that did. When you do the second test, subjects always increase, they kind of learn to get the hang of it. And as you see here, over the duration of the study, we saw no, no further increase in mean power or peak power suggesting that anaerobic performance is not increased either. So that kind of puzzled us. So in the first double-blinded lift high train low study, no single measure of performance was increased. And we, of course, asked ourselves why. Could one reason be that we exposed our subjects to normal baric hypoxia instead of hyperbaric hypoxia, which, for example, um, Ben Levine did. I realize that this is very short acute hypoxia, but after two hours and eight hours of hypoxic exposure, we observe no, no difference in the erythropoietic response. So in the EPO concentration, it increases similarly in both conditions. Uh, Gregor Amier, who will present later today or tomorrow, I'm not exactly sure, but has a point counterpoint on the effects uh, that there may be differences between normal baric and hyperbaric hypoxia. And I suggest you to read this if you're interested in this kind of, in this question. We did a meta-analysis <clears throat> that I will come back to shortly, where we found no significant effects of no, normal baric versus hyperbaric uh, hypoxia in in regards to the increase in red cell mass. So I do not think that our negative results are due to the use of normal baric hypoxia versus hyperbaric hypoxia. And by the way, also others have shown an increase in red cell mass in normal baric hypoxia, of course. I kind of think to, I tend to think that one reason for us not to see anything is that we had a very high initially baseline HB mass. And we simply plotted the studies that conformed to the, to the, to the common rule of how you should perform lift high train loads of 14 hours per day for three weeks at 2,500 meters. It shows a clear line, I think, that if you have a rather low HB mass before the study, that you also have a, a higher increase this is, of course, just a line that we drew. But um, we performed the meta-analysis that I mentioned before with one aim specifically to look, to look at the response in uh, red cell mass uh, with continuous altitude exposure. And there it's clearly seen that, that the higher the initial response, the lower the response you have when you go to high altitude should, of course, be recognized that this is a meta-analysis and the data or the outcome is only as good as the data entering the study. Not many studies have looked at the reproducibility, as mentioned by Chris. And as far as I understood from reading the paper, I wasn't exactly Chris, uh, sure, Chris, what you meant here, so you may want to come, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you saw a reproducible mean improvement, but not at the individual level, right? I think this is uh, important to realize. Again, we simply plotted the study where that conformed to the, the current uh, perception of how you should do a live high to low study. And I would say if you have a low increase in HP mass, you only have a very limited increase in VO2 max, whereas if you have a um, a high increase, you also have a, uh, a big increase in VO2 max, which is 
no surprise, of course. So since uh, I don't have much experience with uh, with um, team sports, but for instance, the the Danish national soccer team, which occasionally does well, their HB masses are very low. I mean, they're nothing compared to uh, to endurance athletes. So they may be able to increase their red cell mass if they engage in live high, train low approaches. <clears throat> but I'm not sure it's worth the trouble to do live high, train low in order to increase your red cell mass in team sport athletes because they are so super low already. You may as, you may as well do a bit of more of training, I would say. The experiences that we have with the Danish national team is that they train between an hour and a half or two hours per day. They have VO2 maxes from ranging from the mid 50s to the low 60s in, re in regards to VO2 max. If it was needed that, uh, to have a high VO2 max, of course they would have a higher VO2 max. So I think there are easier means to increase your HB mass, if that is your aim, in uh, those kind of athletes than going to, through the trouble uh, and do live high, train low. Another thing that we asked ourselves, which, which isn't really clear from the literature, how long time does it actually take AH or HB mass to increase with altitude? <clears throat> there are two reviews on it, kind of vaguely stating that it's one of the slowest occurring processes when exposed to altitude. Berch states that true polycythemia makes several weeks to develop. What is several weeks? I, I would say it's more than three weeks, in my, in my terminology at least. But uh, anyways, the, the statements are very vague. Based on the meta-analysis we did, we, uh, or Peter Rasmussen, he did um, uh, Monte Carlo stimulation where you can then predict how long time do you need to spend at altitude to have, for instance, a 5% increase in red cell mass. If you don't see an increase in red cell mass of 5%, you don't, those studies do not show a significant increase in performance, I would say. If you stay at 2,500 meters, which seems to be the altitude that athletes tend to be exposed to, well, you need to, to stay there for 32 days in order to have, a, according to the meta-analysis, an increase in red cell mass. The higher you stay, the shorter the the duration, of course. I don't think it's absolutely clear that athletes cannot, do not tolerate exposure to 3,500 meters. Well, it is vaguely stated that recovery periods and so on and so on may be affected. But I would say there's absolutely no scientific proof for this. I think it could be interesting if somebody would increase the altitude. So I would not recommend live high, train low to elite athletes, elite endurance athletes, since I would say that live high, train low does not convincingly increase performance in all elite athletes. Also, there's no predictable response for a given individual. This is something that we will look into here uh, this summer, where we will study more than 150 people going to altitude and try to look for genetic markers that will predict whether you increase your red cell mass at altitude or not. Furthermore, it should be recognized that there are several aspects of altitude exposure that may not be good for, for exercise capacity. We always say, yes, if you go to altitude, you may have increase in red cell mass, muscle buffer capacity will be changed, and so on and so on. But uh, it's a clear fact that, for instance, sleeping quality is decreased. Uh, and there are many other examples as well. Uh, a practical limitation is also, I would say, that um, working with the, the Swedish cross-country uh, ski team is that they train two to three times per day. It's rather uh, logistically demanding to have the guys enter the rooms in and out if they go to the glacier to train and so on and so on. It's pretty difficult to get to 14 hours per day, actually. It's not, it's not easy, I would say. And I would not recommend live high train low to elite team sport athletes by any, for any cost, since I still I think they have a great potential to increase physical per performance simply by increasing normal training. 
And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.